myself, put them on various places. So what we're going to talk about today, as the title says, evolution, cannabinoids, and the impact really on the survival of mankind. So you're going to get some uh, hardcore science and you're going to get some speculative science. But what I want to do is address the issue that I think all of us are constantly asking, many of us for many decades, you know, why is it for some it seems like it's so good, and for others, like the White House, it's the worst drug, it's worse than heroin. I mean, to us, that's like absolutely a mind-boggling, ridiculous statement, and yet they make it over and over and over again. And it turns out that there's really a scientific foundation for our intelligence and their stupidity. <laughs> and, and that's what I want to I wanna bring to light, because it is, in fact, very empowering when you see the perspective that I have found so satisfying, and many people uh, agree with it. So I'd like to present it, and, and there's new twists to this. It's been an evolving story that I've been presenting to people for you know, probably around 10 years now, and uh, it's interesting that it's an evolving story about evolving stories, really. So let's start that. Um, so, Natural selection, it's the process by which favorable inheritable, inheritable traits become, become more common in successive generations of a population of reproducing organisms and unfavorable traits become less common due to differential reproduction of genotypes. So what I want to do that, with that is link that to the effects of cannabis and the effects of getting high and its meaning for health. And health, I don't just mean of an individual, but health of our society and health of our planet. It's all tied into this cannabis story quite miraculously. So, first of all, what, what this is showing you is that evolutionary theory as presented by Darwin, that there's more to the story. He only spoke of natural selection, which is why I put that up first. But, you know, as time pro progressed, we learned that we have such a thing as genes, and we learned that we have DNA, and we learned that mutations are kind of the foundation of change from this Darwinian perspective. And that became what is known as the modern synthesis, where we've incorporated molecular biology into Darwinian thoughts on natural selection. But, and I won't go into the rest of that because that gets a little more complicated. What I really want to talk about is that natural selection is a completely devoid and separated from the underlying force of life. Is it just something that acts on life? And I totally say no. I believe that there's a uh, real integration between the selection process and what life really is. And it's been learning about what life really is that has given me an extraordinary amount of, uh, of pleasure and intellectual enjoyment over the uh, probably 25 years or so since I first discovered the work of uh, Ilya Prigogine, who is behind this new physics. And it's a new physics in that Rather than life being an impossible to understand miracle, we see that it's a natural process based on physics. So Prigogine got his Nobel Prize, and he developed the term far from equilibrium thermodynamics. Far from equilibrium means something is not at rest, essentially that it's like a charged up battery versus a discharged battery. The discharged battery is at equilibrium. The charged battery is far from equilibrium. It can do things. And the essence of Prigogine's work is that unlike conventional thinking that says uh, you can't have organization based on the, what's known as the second law of thermodynamics, that entropy must increase, and entropy is a measure of disorder. So the natural way of the universe is to increase disorder, and then we have life. So it seems that there's contradiction there. And in fact, Prigogine recast that thinking into a much more enlightened mode. And basically, the, uh, the uh, incredible irony is that when a system is far from equilibrium, exactly the opposite things happen from equilibrium. And yet, all of the math and the physics that most of us are taught has to do with equilibrium science, which says life can't exist, whereas far from equilibrium science says it must exist. So it's the must exist that I'm going to follow up on in this talk. But this is a, uh, is a quote that Prigogine uses frequently, used frequently, he's dead now. The more deeply we study the nature of time, the better we understand that duration means invention, creation of forms, and continuous elaboration of the absolutely new. This is really quite profound and totally against the conventional way of thinking. Because what he's showing us here is that creation, change, is 
an essential, vital part to the unfolding of the universe. And we are part of that unfolding. And our evolutionary history is. And our social history is. And that's what I want to link all together. So creativity is a natural process and cannabinoids play a natural role in this process. And this is what becomes so, you know, so outrageously funny you know, for, for me. So what you're seeing here is a petri dish. And in that petri dish is an oil. And that oil was heated. And what spontaneously and magically occurred is it formed these hexagonal convection cells, which you can see in magnification there. And if we flip that on the side, what you see is the heat is coming from below, and that the warm molecules are going up the side of each one of those convection cells and giving off the heat to the atmosphere above. And then the cool molecules funnel down the center. So what's happened here is quite amazing. Out of billions and billions and trillions of molecules that are in that dish, 10 to the 20 approximately, a huge, huge number, they have spontaneously organized themselves and collaborated with one another to create these structures. And by doing that, what they are doing is they are generating more entropy, more disorder in their surroundings, meaning the atmosphere above us receiving the heat. So what we've seen here is a spontaneous change where molecules on, at a distance within that petri dish co collaborate and communicate with one another to create these structures so that essentially the system has gotten smarter. It's decreased its entropy, but in doing so, they make the universe stupider quicker. In other words, they're increasing the entropy of the universe. So this is what drives this creative phenomena, that the basic law of physics is that when we have situations far from equilibrium, when we have collections of molecules far from equilibrium, they have a natural quality, and we don't understand exactly what that means, but they have a natural quality to solve the problem. What's the problem? How can we get smarter to make the universe stupid? And that's what evolution is about, because it's an extension of this very process. Here we saw evolution of a chemical system in the test tube. Well, imagine evolution on the planet, driven by sunlight and thermal vents and volcanoes occurring over billions of years. That led to us, and I want to go into a little about what that means. So here we have another example of one of these far from equilibrium situations driving organization under circumstances that it doesn't make sense to us intuitively. You know, we don't expect a liquid, which we expect everything to be homogeneous and random, to organize itself. And here is another kind of example.